Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Andrew Schwartz here at CSIS. Um, it is such a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thanks for bearing with the weather or non-weather, whatever we call it here in DC. Um, this is a terrific panel we have tonight, but before we get to it, I have some people I need to thank. First, I need to thank the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, who have made this series possible with their generous grant. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Horn Frogs at TCU. Uh, we didn't make it to the national championship this year, but we would have beat Ohio State, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my wife's from Ohio and half the family went to Ohio State, so I probably shouldn't be saying that uh, in public. Um, without further ado, is there anybody better than Bob Schieffer? Did you guys watch last night on the State of the Union? Bob Schieffer, <laughs> welcome. Is that it? <laughs> <Where'd he go? laughs> Let me introduce him. <laughs> got, got to work on the hand roughs. <laughs> A terrific panel here tonight. Jim Lewis, and I think most of you here know him, director, senior fellow of the uh, Strategic Technologies Program here at CSIS. Used to work at the Department of State, the Department of Commerce, Foreign Service Officer, authors has authored numerous uh, CSIS publications on the relationship between national power and technology. He got his PhD at the University of Chicago, uh, where one of the Sanger children is about to uh, enroll. And he, I have to say, is the go-to guy uh, on cyber. And uh, when I uh, moderated the presidential debate uh, last time out, he was the first guy I talked to about cyber and convinced me he knows more about it than anybody I know, so uh, we're always glad to him. have him, Sean uh, Henry, uh, now the uh, president of CrowdStrike Services and Company. Um, it's a uh, computer security uh, company. He's a retired executive assistant director at the FBI, credited with boosting the uh, agency's computer crime and cybersecurity investigation capabilities, oversaw crime investigations across the globe including bank and corporate breaches and uh, state-sponsored intrusions. And our buddy uh, David Sanger, as I'm sure all of you know, national security correspondent for the New York Times, twice been a member of uh, Times reporting teams uh, that have won the Pulitzer, uh, correspondent, bureau chief for the Times uh, in Tokyo for six years, covered Japan's rise in the world as the second largest economic power, then his downfall into recession. He has also shared his reporting and insight many Sundays uh, on Face the Nation, uh, and the author of a recent book on all of this stuff, and uh, we're always glad to, uh, to have David with us. Well, uh, let me just start out by asking the panel a question. Last night, of course, was the uh, State of the Union message. The uh, president uh, addressed cybersecurity. Uh, I'd just like to hear from each of you, and we'll start with you, Jim. Tell us what the president said. What did you make of it? And should he have said something other than what he did say? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank David for opening the uh, statements here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it was a good try, though. It didn't work. Um, I, I didn't, it, part of it is that it, they'd already shown so much leg and gone around briefing people, I didn't really think there was anything particularly new in what he said. Uh, there, it, they didn't go into a long uh, uh, exegesis on cybersecurity. You know, the, the drill in the State of the Union is you always try and get like your issue or your paragraph in it. And because then what you can say later on in interagency discussions, well, the president said in the State of the Union, but in this case, I think more is going on than he said. They put a lot of emphasis on uh, uh, information sharing because that is the current primary task for the guys doing cybersecurity at the White House. They have both a legislative package, not particularly new, and also some kind of executive action that we'll see probably next month. So um, one of the things I think you said this, you, just, you, you or David said, you were a little surprised you didn't utter the words North and Korea in sequence, it would have been nice. I guess they thought maybe it was a little I didn't hear him out of sequence. Well, <laughs> if you look at the beginning and the end of the text, he actually, never mind. Um, 
you know, that one has turned into more of a debate than I think people would have expected, and it says something maybe about why they, they kept it as a relatively neutral statement, is that there is a lot of skepticism about what the U.S. is doing, a lot of questions. You know, I know that more is going on behind the scenes, so it didn't particularly bother me. How about you, Sean? Uh, I, I know that there's more going on behind the scenes, too. I, I think that was the perfect stage for the president to tell the general public what's happening. You know, the public is looking at uh, Target and Home Depot and JPMC and a whole Sony and a whole host of other things. And I think that there's a lot of concern in the general public. I think that there are people who don't know what's happening. They don't understand how the, the threat to our critical infrastructure, what the risks are and what the cascading implications are of something like that. Uh, when there's a destructive attack, not just the theft of personally identifiable information, but actual hardware that's being destroyed from 6,000 miles away. I think it was the perfect opportunity to tell the general public two things. Uh, first, that we're addressing this. This is important. We recognize it as, a, as an issue. And secondly, there are actions that we're going to take. You know, we're focusing on terrorism, certainly. We're focusing on crime, certainly. But this issue, which is a new threat, an emerging risk to the American public, it's something that we're attentive to, we understand, and we are going to send a message to the rest of the world about how we are going to address this, because the risk is too high. So I think there was a missed opportunity there, and I think that much of the statement um, was general and, and needed to, to be a little more emphatic. Would, would you say, Sean, that the threat that uh, cyber poses to this country is greater or less than people recognize right now? I think, I think that it's greater than the average American recognizes. I don't think the average American really understands. And I'll, I'll use the Sony breach as, as, a, as an example why. What I read and what I saw, and I've watched a lot of media on it, and I've heard people talk about it, read the blogs, et cetera. What I saw and heard about the Sony breach um, was Angelina Jolie is a spoiled brat, and it was in a in an email, and that you know, people stole these emails, which happened, and people um, wanted to disrupt the, dis the distribution of a movie, which happened. But there was a, a physical attack, there was a hardware attack, there was destruction of physical equipment. That is a changing and evolving risk, and I don't think the average American recognizes what that risk is. What they see in here is theft of email, somebody lost $25,000, uh, somebody lost their credit card number. I don't think they understand the physical implications of this, and that to me is a concern. You know, I, that, that's an interesting point. Someone was telling me today, and I was totally aware, uh, unaware of this, uh, Sony's IT system uh, was pretty much wrecked. I mean, there are people in that company now that still don't have email uh, because uh, of the damage that was done to their system, and that's something that I have no idea about. You've just made my point. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. But and some would say it's, it's a about. good thing they don't have access to email after what we did. <laughs> <laughs> David, uh, tell me what, uh, you know, I know as a journalist, I don't expect you to pass judgment on what the president said last night, but you just hear two gentlemen say that, and I know you never do. Oh, of course not. I have no opinions, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you just heard these uh, two experts on this. Um, what could the president have said? No, I agree with Sean. This was a missed opportunity. And the reason it was a missed opportunity is the president said less than he actually said in his December 19th news conference, where he took the major step of identifying North Korea as, and its leadership as the group responsible, in his view, for the Sony hack. Now, why was the Sony hack different? Sean hit the first point on it. This was the first major state-sponsored destructive attack in the United States. We've only seen a handful of major destructive attacks. Stuxnet Olympic Games, which was the US and Israel against Iran, an attack on South Korea that it, people are widely believe but hasn't quite been proven was North Korea uh, in 2013, uh, an attack on Saudi Aramco, which uh, has been attributed to Iran. Um, there was an attack in Germany recently against a steel company. But you can count on one hand the number of serious destructive attacks 
that we've seen, and this was the first one in the US. It's the fact that it was a destructive attack combined with that sort of 9-11-ish sounding threat to the theaters that you heard the week before Christmas that raised this in the White House in a way that other attacks had not prompted a national response. Think of the other attacks that were mentioned just before. Home Depot, Target, J.P. Morgan Chase, could have added Bank of America from a year before. In each of those, the president's view was the people who run these systems are, are responsible for protecting them. And the US government can't step in and retaliate for every commercial attack that's out there. In the Sony case, he made a different decision largely because it was a destructive attack and he wanted to begin to try to create some sense of deterrence. And that's why he said we will deal with the North Koreans at the time and place of our choosing. We've never heard that before in the case of a, of a cyber attack. And so the missed opportunity, Bob, I think, was just to repeat what he said in front of a much smaller audience during that December 19th um, uh, press conference so that he could begin to create some sense of deterrence. A, a last point on this, uh, we did an interview back in June with uh, Admiral Rogers, the new, then new head of the National Security Agency, and we were talking about sort of long-term goals. And he said, you know, David, the one thing I've got to do while I'm here is get past the moment where people think that cyber attacks on the United States are cost-free. There's got to be some sense of a price to pay. And the Sony one was the first one where they began to create that. Uh, Jim, I know you've uh, written a lot about this, but I'd love to hear from, from both of you on it. Why did so many experts, so-called experts, uh, question the government's uh, conclusion that this was the work of North Korea? Well, the, the, the internet is, uh, you know, people talk about it being a platform for uh, democratizing uh, information and expertise. And it is, but democratizing doesn't necessarily mean good. So it's kind of a giant sounding board where bad ideas can reverberate uh, endlessly. People aren't trained in this kind of analysis. It's not something you just pick up by watching a couple of the Bourne movies, you know. And there's a, a, a for obvious reasons, a, a not a lot of insight into the intelligence activities that lay behind the US decision. Um, that said, I think the <clears throat> fundamental reason was a distrust of the intelligence community, a distrust of the American government, uh, damage to the credibility of the government over the last 15 years has been what we saw reflected in this, uh, in this incident. And I, I'd ask some of the loudest uh, critics, you know, I said, you, you, you believed in Snowden. You uh, said everything that Snowden said was true. And you love Snowden. In fact, you wear a Snowden mask at home at night in your bed. But, <laughs> but Snowden said, Snowden said, I have a Snowden mask upstairs if anyone wants to borrow it. Uh, you, Snowden said, NSA spies on everyone all the time, everywhere. And yet you refuse to believe that they knew it was North Korea. Not talking about how they knew, but how is that? And you know, the people get defensive and say, well, you know, it's not the same, and blah, blah, blah. It's, you don't want to believe that NSA could do this. You don't want to believe that the US could do this. And again, this is a point we were talking about a little earlier. We have not always been the most uh, open government when it comes to the capabilities we have acquired in cyberspace, either for offensive action or now for attribution. And that's because of the close link to intelligence. Sean, you don't have any doubt, do you, that North Korea is the one responsible. Um, you know, attribution is, is very, very difficult. Um, I, I think that you've got to look at the totality of the circumstances and the totality of the pool of evidence to come up with a conclusion, a reasonable conclusion. You know, we, we put people on death row for proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It doesn't mean that there's, that's never wrong. Mm -hmm. But that being said, let me say this. Um, we, in, at CrowdStrike where I work, um, we, uh, look at intelligence indicators, uh, indicators of attack 
indicators of compromise. We, we work very, very diligently to do attribution in a whole host of these types of investigations because we believe that it's really important for some of the, the points that both David and Jim made. Um, it's important to do attribution so that you can send a message to the actors, whether from a criminal perspective you're bringing somebody to justice or from a national security perspective you're able to, uh, to launch some type of sanctions. There's got to be a cost. People have to understand. So we do attribution and we have looked at the indicators that, uh, that the FBI put out and we have been tracking North Korea for six years and we believe that it is also likely, as the government came to a similar conclusion, that North Korea is involved based on the tactics and techniques that were utilized um, in this in, in investigation or in this attack. Um, based on prior attacks, we've done, had conversations with folks in South Korea about attacks that David alluded to earlier where uh, it's, it's believed that North Koreans were involved. And when you start to look at numerous attacks in the aggregate and all the intelligence that's collected over a protracted period of time, um, you're able to start to put the pieces of the puzzle together. In listening to what the government has said and in listening to what some of the skeptics have said, um, those skeptics have a very narrow view of, uh, and they've seen a very narrow view of what actually has occurred. And the totality of circumstances, the totality of the investigation, which is the intelligence community, there's forensics on the ground, there's interviews, there's SIGINT through the intelligence community, there's UMINT through the intelligence community, there's SIGINT through international partners, there's UMINT through international partners. I know what goes into these investigations because I worked them for many years in the Bureau, and it is a wide-ranging collection of intelligence that leads to a conclusion. So we looked at the indicators as a private sector company, and we said we believe that this is likely tied to North Korea. The U.S. government made a similar conclusion. Their totality of circumstances, I'm certain, is much broader than ours. And, and David, uh, that was a whole basis of, of this extensive reporting that you did. You, you reported how. The United States uh, was able to do, to make uh, this determination. Well, you know, I come into this, Bob, as a reporter like you, not as a cyber expert uh, like our other uh, uh, panelists. But one thing I know from covering cyber issues for uh, as long as I have is that attribution is slow and painstaking, takes a lot of time. So this attack was on November 24th. And by the second week of December, we had people in the U.S. government saying there's definitive evidence that it was from North Korea. And then the president comes out and says this on December 19th, so not even a month after uh, the attack. And as soon as those words came out of his mouth, we had to think that he must have seen something pretty definitive, because what we know about President Obama is he is very cautious. He's particularly cautious and somewhat suspicious on intelligence issues. And he was highly critical of his predecessor leaping to conclusions on intelligence about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. In fact, it's part of how he got elected president. So the fact that he was willing to basically get out there and make this accusation, not simply that the attack emerged from North Korea, which is something they've said before about attacks from Iran or Russia or so forth, but that the leadership was responsible, told us that he must have seen something. And uh, there was an allusion made before to the Snowden documents. A lot of people talk about the Snowden documents, and a lot of people talk about the privacy issues in them. If you actually go and read the Snowden documents, or at least those that have become uh, public, <laughs> you find a lot about US use of implants in China and some in North Korea. And in fact, just this weekend, just before we published our piece, uh, Der Spiegel, the German magazine, published a series of new Snowden documents. And one of them referred specifically to an operation to get inside North Korea. We linked to it from, uh, from our story. So um, it, there's not a huge amount of mystery here. If you're going to have rapid attribution, it's usually because you can see the attack massing. And you can only see the attack massing if you actually have your computer surveillance underway inside the, the location where it's coming together. Uh, 
what should uh, CEOs take away from this attack? And, and Sean will concede they should hire your company. That would be their <laughs> first thing they ought to do. But I mean, what, uh, Jim, what, what should they, what did they learn from this? Or what should we learn? What we should learn and what they should learn are different. And Sean gave you a clue as to what the CEO should learn, uh, which is they've probably underestimated risk. They need to recalculate the risk of cyber attack. And most companies have risk management <coughs> committees. I hope they all have cyber as part of the risk management portfolio. They need, thank you, they need to think about um, recovery plans because a company is not going to be able to stand up to a state opponent. Uh, they need to think about what they put in their emails. Some of us learned the hard way that you should think about what your emails will look like if they're on the front page of the Times. My example, of course, used the word frog in an unflattering way towards a NATO ally. And when you see that, you have to think, when I'm writing this, it's a postcard. What do I think about? So you've got to think about damage control and mitigation. You've got to think about re-estimating risk and spending more. And you've got to think about what you put in email. And I know that's tough for people, because we're used to thinking of this as a private communication that we can write anything we want. And it's just not true. So that's Well, what I mean, those are the same things I tell my 13-year-old granddaughter. But I mean, it's <laughs> almost like, as adults, we all need to uh, remember that, too. Sean, uh, what do you tell people? Oh, I, I agree with everything Jim said. I, I think that um, organizations, I do a lot of, of speaking to the C-suite and to boards, and I can tell you that this, this conversation has evolved in the last decade from system administrators who are the people that are, you know, kind of hands on the keyboard working on the networks all the way through uh, to CIOs, corporate uh, general counsels, and now it really is sitting in the board of directors, um, that we, are, we can't prevent these attacks. What many people still today don't understand is that the U.S. government, we're talking about the government, the U.S. government has a fundamental responsibility to protect its citizens. That's its primary role, in my opinion. And we do that in the physical world against missiles and against foreign armies and against foreign jet fighters. But we do not do that in this space, and that there are malicious ones and zeros that are landing on corporate networks every single day, and the government can't stop it. What I tell CEOs is you are responsible for this because the government can't, not because they don't want to, but there are policies and there are capabilities and there are capacity issues that won't allow it today, under, in today's environment. And I know there's legislation that's pending, et cetera, but under today's environment, it's not gonna happen. Therefore, Mr. CEO, you've got to move into a detection phase because you cannot expect that the government will prevent this. You can't expect that your existing technology is going to prevent all of this. You've got to move into detection and into remediation. And if you detect these issues quickly enough, you can mitigate the consequences. In most of these investigations that I've been involved with, both from the, the FBI side and from the CrowdStrike side, we have gone into environments where the network has been breached for months, and in some cases, years, completely undetected. And if you give the adversary months or years of time on the network, they are going to do whatever they want on that network. Theft of intellectual property, research and development, and, and destruction of data. If you can detect it quickly, you can mitigate it. So it really is about them understanding the risk and then taking proactive actions on their network to identify these threats today and not relying on somebody else to prevent it. You know, Bob, in the case of Sony, it's, it's sort of interesting because we think about this as an attack that happened the week before Thanksgiving. But it actually began in early September. Well, in, over the summer, there were warnings to the State Department, a letter the North Koreans sent to the UN Secretary General saying that the, um, uh, the release of this movie, the interview, uh, which was not necessarily the most sophisticated comedy I've ever watched with the kids, but you know, nonetheless, um, <laughs> would be an act of war. Okay, so in September, there were spear phishing attacks on Sony, and what we determined in the court, the spear phishing attacks are those emails you know you get that they, they all, you know, they may look perfectly friendly, but when you click on it, it downloads some malware into your into your system. And as we went back and did the reconstruction, 
what we learned was that the North Koreans then quietly spent, or whoever these hackers were, but if you believe the government's account, the North Koreans, they spent the next two months mapping the Sony system, undetected figuring out their file structure, figuring out what was vital, what wasn't. So when the attack actually launched on November 24th, that's why it did so much damage and shut down so many computers. And you know, one of the few mistakes <coughs> that the hackers made was that they put this sort of skull and crossbones and so forth up on the screen, which warned people who actually had their computers on at the time and were sitting in front of them there was an attack underway. And some of them reached back and actually unplugged their computers, which is why they were able to recover some of the data from their hard drives. Had the North Koreans not put that up on the screen, and Sean would know this a whole lot better than I would, I suspect they probably would have done even more damage. Well, you know, I, not to get too basic here, but what should I do every day, okay? I'm, I work in CBS, I have, I have a computer, I'm, you know, I'm online all the time. What should I be just just as as a person there? What are the things I should do? You need to go back to pen and paper, Bob. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm not against that. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Particularly when I'm not nasty notes, right? Uh, I know, but I mean, okay, the, the things pop up there. Just don't open anything that you are not aware of. I mean, you don't know where it's coming from or what. You, you have to assess how much risk you think you face as a person, and because a lot of these things are things you're not gonna to wanna to do. So change your password. How often do you change your password? It's a pain in the neck, especially with this complex password stuff. Um, I change my password after every trip, right? That's a hassle. Really? Right? Yeah, um, and I change it randomly, and I do things that make me forget it, and I can't log into stuff, and it's a pain in the neck, right? Change your password. Data backup. Do you have the, the stuff that you care about stored somewhere that's not online? It could be a thumb drive. Thumb drives are amazing now. You have to store that stuff. And then you have to think about what you're writing. And um, I was going to say communications discipline, which is one of my favorite lectures, but I won't. You have, to think, about what you're, you have to think about what you're writing. And if you, you know, it's the New, York Time, what, the New York Times test, or sorry, the Washington Post test, depending yeah. on. Are you going to want to see it in the Times? Yeah. So, Password. The other stuff is basic hygiene that hopefully your network administrators take care of at home. You know, are you doing the patching and updating? If people want to get you, they're going to get you, but you can minimize the damage by storing offline and by restricting what you actually communicate. Uh, do you have any tips on passwords, either of you? I mean, well, tell me yours and I'll give you a tip. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it should not be anything that is familiar to it? Is it better to use numbers? Is it better to use? So one time I was in a meeting with some of our foreign friends from a Signals Intelligence Agency, and this probably gives it away. But you know the London Times crossword puzzle, which I can get zero on? This guy was sitting there, it was actually a woman, doing it in ink, and it took her about six minutes, right? The people who do this are gonna figure it out if you use a word. Right, for crying out loud. And especially if you use a word to link to you and you've put it on your Facebook mm -hmm. page. Oh, thank you, thank you, social media, because I, I, can, I can harvest your password. So don't use your dog's name, uh, don't use stuff, don't be cute, you know, eight hackers, I'll put a Z at the end instead of an S. I'll, I'll never figure that out, you know? It's like, so you really have to, but that makes it hard. You know, that makes it hard. So uh, I won't even tell you which accounts I'm locked out of right now because I can't remember my complex <laughs> password. <laughs> but it's a choice. Do you, if you don't do the password, you're going to be, you, you and we've, we've said this before, you two guys and probably you two, you're great targets. I mean, access to your files, who wouldn't want it, right? Access, the, I don't know what you keep on your computers, but it'd be a lot of fun, right? So you, you are a higher risk, at higher risk than most, most of us. But when you talk about this spear fishing, I mean, I guess the point I'm trying to make, this could happen to any of us. I mean, these, and is it these people that have these uh, uh, extortion schemes from Nigeria that, you know, what happens if you open that? I mean, when I open it by mistake and then I delete it immediately, but that's not good enough, is it? You really shouldn't open it. It, it depends. So if there's a, if it, if the email has a payload in it that will 
infect your computer and give the remote operator some kind of control, yeah, you're in trouble. If it's just, I get them all the time and I'm so upset, man. Where are my francs? I just told me I won the French lottery. And um, if you get one of those that just say, hey, you won the lottery, you're, you're probably safe. You're, you, you won't get the money, but you're, you're probably safe. <laughs> <laughs> Why did North Korea do this? Is it for what would seem to be the obvious reason? Uh, or is there something beyond that? Let's say you were uh, a god, uh, at least in your own mind, and certainly in the minds of those around you. But you're a worried god because you've had to open your economy up. It's not the hermit kingdom anymore, and so people go to China. Um, you know, I, they see how people live in China, which is infinitely better. They've given them smartphones. You're, you're a vulnerable god in a way that perhaps your grandfather wasn't vulnerable. And somebody does this uh, movie that tastelessly shows you uh, being uh, blown up at the end. And this is damaging you to you in a couple ways. The movie. Yes, yeah, spoiler I alert. See yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. But the comparison you want to make. Uh, 2000, here, I'll do it. I'll do it. They can't stop me. Hans Bricks. Ah, oh, no. Team America uh, kills, kills Kim Jong-il, right? And the North Koreans couldn't do anything about it. Here, the, the, the god figure had been killed, and there was nothing they can do. Thanks to the internet, there is now something they can do. It was political. Bob, uh, can I for Yeah, uh, I, I agree with everything that Jim said there, but... Um, as somebody who's covered North Korea on and off since I lived back in Tokyo, um, cyber is a weapon that is perfect for failed states that feel as if they've got very little ability to strike back at their adversaries. And it's perfect for several reasons. First of all, it's cheap. Don't underestimate the importance of cheap when you're dealing with a country like North Korea. Secondly, it's a lot more usable than a nuclear weapon. A nuclear weapon is on an on-off switch. The North Koreans like to have the nuclear arsenal because it can help preserve the regime, but they know that if they ever used it, they know what happened 60 minutes later. 32. 32 minutes later. They're even closer. Um, thirdly, they're a lot more accurate than North Korean missiles. Think about North Korean missile tests. <laughs> Um, and they're on, instead of being on an on-off switch, they're, they're like your thermostat. They're on a rheostat, right? So you can turn a, a, a cyber weapon up or down and try to modulate it in a way that you don't think that there will be retaliation, especially if you think somebody can't figure out that it was yours. And uh, this is why I think Admiral Rogers was talking about why there's got to be a price. Because, because the attribution is so difficult, it makes a lot of people feel safe in using them. And because they can modulate it, they think, well, I can stay just below the threshold where someone's going to come back and get at me. And in this case, the question is, did the North Koreans get that setting right? I'm not sure the sanctions that the Obama administration announced against North Korea on January 2nd are going to make a huge difference to their lives since they've been sanctioned by every president since Harry Truman, and it's kind of hard to figure out new sanctions that would make a difference. Um, so in the end, I think the question about this is going to be, did they really pay a price? Do uh, <clears throat> uh, One thing, uh, we were talking about what the president said last night, and I think David reminded has the president ever talked about our offensive capability? If he has, I've missed it, and I watch it uh, pretty carefully. Um, it's interesting because, obviously, the United States, after, uh, as the nuclear age started, because we had dropped a bomb on, two bombs on Japan, it was no secret we had offensive nuclear weapons, and we spent 25 years debating how to use them and ended up in that debate in a very different place than we started off. In the case of drones, the United States wouldn't discuss them for years. I was White House correspondent for most of the Bush administration, and you know the White House press secretary couldn't even use the word drone. Remember how many times people came on your show and they wouldn't use the word drone, <laughs> even though you did in the question, right? Um, 
But in the case of cyber, the United States government is still in that phase where they think that they don't want to acknowledge having a significant arsenal of offensive cyber weapons. And even after the disclosures about Olympic Games, the attack on Iran, uh, and the fact that the code itself got out in that particular case because of nobody's fault, but just an accident, even then the United States has never uh, acknowledged it. Um, at some point, the US is gonna have to do it because at some point, we're gonna try to get into negotiations as a country to set some norms about how one uses offensive weapons. It's very hard to have that conversation if you don't acknowledge owning some. Mm -hmm. What about that? Well, we are uh, having that conversation. And of course, what governments say in private to each other might be a little different than what they say in public. And that might be unfair. DOD did put out some recent doctrine that if you know what lies behind it, it, it points towards offensive capabilities. We are having discussions with other countries about the norms for the use of uh, cyber techniques uh, for force, for attack, and for coercion. It, it hasn't been an issue, in part because everyone assumes the nice thing about, so a, a friend of mine was telling me when I started negotiating with the Chinese a long time ago, he said, you have to remember that they think we're like the Borg. You know, our motto is prepare to be assimilated. We're an advanced technological power that brooks no opposition. And that's what people think when you talk to the Russians or the Chinese. So we don't have to tell them we have offensive capabilities. In their wildest imaginings, they think we have death rays and flying saucers. And you know, what have the Americans thought up now? And they're freaked out about it. So I, the conversation on norms is difficult. And this might be one reason why you don't see um, as much public discussion. And th there's an issue that you don't usually think about, but it's the third party issue. To carry out one of these attacks, you have to go over somebody else's networks. It's very unclear how international law, how the laws of armed conflict apply to that. And so countries have currently taken the position of saying, what are you talking about? I, I don't, I, third party? I don't know. Any, what, it's, it's too hard to deal with. And there are discussions. There are norms. There was agreement in 2013 on um, some very general norms by the, gen by the UN General Assembly, so all nations. Those discussions are ongoing, but they're very difficult legal issues that make you think, maybe I shouldn't be so open about this. Nobody, nobody else comes out and says I have it too. You know, nobody else has come it, out it's, and said It's interesting though, because you, you raise a, a, a big question then for me. Because if the Chinese and the Russians both believe that we've got certain capabilities, um, that has not dissuaded them that in and of itself has not dissuaded them from stealing the intellectual property and the research and development from major corporations around this country and quite frankly around the globe. We've done attribution back to Russia in US energy companies. We've done attribution back to China in you name the sector. And uh, that's been communicated and it's very clear. There's really no doubt there. Yet um, they have not, they have not they have not acknowledged any red line. They continue to cross over because they have not seen the results or the, the impact of any of that breach. No, I think they have acknowledged a red line. And so under international law, uh, espionage does not justify the use of force in response. You can commit espionage and nobody's gonna go to war over it. We should be thankful for that, right? <laughs> and there is, a, there is an implicit threshold now becoming more explicit in international discussions. The threshold is use of force or armed attack. What qualifies as use of force or armed attack, that would justify a military response. Espionage is not use of force or armed attack. So I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting use of force for that. I'm talking about <clears throat> going back to the, the norms that you discussed. Mm -hmm. There's not been anything dictated, certainly not that I've seen, that clearly lays out what the ramifications are gonna be for crossing that red line. And they are over that red line every single day, right now, today. Well, the, the, the only legal instrument, the only internationally agreed instrument that the, the, we possess would be in the trade realm, in uh, TRIPS and in uh, WTO. I, okay, I'll right. accept that. So China, nobody forced China to sign on to WTO. They did it willingly to get market access, but they also committed 
to protect intellectual property and treat foreign companies the same way they treat their own companies. They're not living up to that commitment. Now you're asking, why haven't we as a nation pushed harder on there that? There you go. That's a different question. Ask that question. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Well, some of it is this is still, it is, uh, it is um, closely linked to intelligence. People don't like to talk about it. The trade lawyers are relatively conservative. When I started talking to trade lawyers about this, geez, three or four years ago, the, the first one I talked to said, there's nothing we can do. I was like, don't open the talks by surrendering, you know. Um, there's a reluctance to take this on. And you, as with North Korea, People put this in the larger spectrum of our bilateral relations. And so with China, for example, um, previously there was a desire not to rock the boat when we were in our economic recovery. And so the decision was we're not going to push them on this because it might hurt us economically. I know I'm being inarticulate on this. That's usually that. And when I close my eyes, means I'm thinking a classified thought. Um, you were trying to, I thought yeah. you were trying to remember your password. No. <laughs> no, I've given up. And things have changed now. So the indictments were a good first step. Now we have to see what falls on. Bob, you know, just listening to the president's language on this tells you how difficult it's been for the government to deal with this subject. So in some interviews he did just before he went on vacation in Hawaii, you may remember he was asked whether this was cyber terrorism. <laughs> happened when, right, this is right after he identified North Korea as a culprit. And he stopped and he said, no, this was cyber vandalism. And then we had a couple of senators step in and say, the president doesn't know the difference between cyber vandalism and cyber terrorism. This is cyber terrorism. And then we asked some people on the Hill, so what's your definition of cyber terrorism? And they said, well, if you conduct a um, cyber attack with the intention of destroying things. So we asked the question, so if it was the United States that was behind the attacks on the Natanz nuclear enrichment plan, was that an act of terrorism? Well, no, not exactly, <laughs> if that's what happened. So we we're having real definitional problems here. What, uh, when uh, David Cameron came here, uh, we know he came here uh, and he was going to urge the president. Uh, in some stories, they said to criticize U.S. companies uh, mm -hmm. for resisting efforts to give the government greater power to uh, read encrypted messages. What, what does that mean? So just to, to a quick follow-up to David before tackling yeah. that one. Remember that espionage is a two-way street, and we've told other countries it's a two-way street. You spy on us, we spy on you. This is what big powers do. There's a difference, though. We are not involved in commercial espionage. The U.S. government is not stealing from foreign companies and giving it to U.S. companies. And that is happening. U.S. companies are being raped and pillaged every single day. Uh, and so uh, in discussions with the People's Liberation Army and the Ministry of State Security, I've heard U.S. officials say exactly that. And the response has been, you know, uh, in China, for us, building our economy and growing our technological base, those are national security issues. We think this is legitimate. And that's a fair point to have a discussion on. And maybe we need a new norm relating to espionage. But you know, they want to play the ball game that's going to do the best for them. We want them to say, no, play by our rules, where you automatically lose. Gosh, why won't they go along? We, so we, I, we, can't, I, we can't send attorneys over there then who say we can't do anything as their opening position. On his, when his stuff on Olympic Games came out, I was talking to some Chinese friends and I said, um, so were you guys surprised by that? And they said, no, we always knew it was you. And I said, yeah, oh yeah, how do you know it was us? And, he sa and the, the individual said, who was a Chinese official, he said, no other country has that many lawyers involved in, uh, in their programs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but then I said, you guys don't have lawyers? And he said, no, but they're increasing. So, <laughs> give them a couple years. You can send. You can send your. Uh, you can send your lawyers. I'm not sending lawyers. You went over there with a lawyer. <laughs> but on this thing, is what's... this? I oh. guess the yeah. other question no. I was going to ask related okay. to Cameron: uh, Are we going to see a different attitude in this country uh, toward the National Security Agency and so forth after seeing this this uh, hacking incident here? I, I don't think, frankly. Um, there was a, a, a very vocal 
uh, group, probably I'd say 20, 25% of the population that was uh, very hostile to NSA, very hostile to its activities. And I'd say the majority of Americans understood what it was doing. I don't know if you agree with that. It looks like you don't. Well, um, I was going to say, I think that there's something that has changed in this encryption debate. I think you touched on it, Bob. Uh, if you listen to Cameron last week, he said, we need to have a way of getting into iChat, and we need a way of getting into uh, WhatsApp and other encrypted forms of communication. And what's really changed the argument, I think, came about last fall when the new operating system for the iPhone came out along with the, the iPhone 6. Because this operating system automatically encrypted data. But not only did it automatically encrypt it, it did it in a way where Apple didn't hold on to the key. So only you had the key, really, to go do it. And that changes things. Because in the old days, the FISA court or an ordinary court could issue a warrant. They could go to Apple with a, with a, a physical telephone and say, download all the messages that are in here. Now, with this new operating system, as it takes off, if you go to Apple with that and you ask them to download all the data, they will hand you a large pile of complete gibberish and say, good luck, send us a postcard when you've decrypted this in about five years. Okay. And that is what's driving the intelligence agencies and many of the law enforcement agencies a little bit crazy. Because at the moment that Apple and Google and some uh, new products they're going to be rolling out, and Microsoft as well, throws away the key, then they feel like they can't get at it. And that's what Cameron is talking about banning. Now, President Obama had never really spoken on this before, but if you look carefully at what he said at that news conference on Friday with Cameron, he seemed to come out closer to where Cameron was than I've ever heard him before. But not endorse it entirely. Did not he endorse it entirely. Open out. Let's have some questions uh, from the audience. Anybody uh, have a thought? This lady right here. Oof. Former senior UN official. Yes, former, yeah. former, um, former uh, head of the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research in Geneva. Mm -hmm. And I, I have two questions. Um, this was a fascinating panel. It was really interesting and different perspectives. Um, but I have, I have two questions, and they, they tend to relate to the issue of seeing um, the cyber issue always through the national security lens and how perhaps that's not quite the whole picture, the holistic picture. So the first question is, we were talking about this attack on Sony as being the first attack on, uh, attack on infrastructure that did something destructive in the United States, except that the first attack on infrastructure that did something bad was pretty much, we think, from the US and Israel on Iran and Stuxnet. Um, and there are a lot of lawyers, international lawyers, who said at the time, that the Iranians might have been able to make a case under UN, um, under, uh, under law, international law, that this was an armed attack that they could respond to. They didn't. Um, I would like to ask the panelists about how they think about that and what they think might have been the motivations for not and why we didn't and all of that. The second question I have is that if you're really looking at national security, we have a big problem here because in order to defend stuff, both nationally and internationally, the government who knows about um, ways of attacking and, and bugs and et cetera, et cetera, has to actually warn the private sector. But if you want to keep offensive tools in your arsenal, then you don't tell anybody about those zero day attacks that you've ordered from hackers on the, on the gray net or the black net, and you're keeping in your arsenal to be able to attack other people. But every time you do that, you leave everybody else, especially the private sector, open to attack. So how do you balance that in a national security realm? Because that's a, that's a really hard question, right? Okay. So I'd like to hear the panel's um, response on that. All Thank right, you. well, let's see. Uh, Iran was killing American soldiers in Iraq. Uh, the US chose not to go to a war with uh, Iran. Um, 
it's a political decision. And so, you know, from Pueblo on, the fact that it qualifies as the use of force does not mean, therefore, that it, it is an act of war. And so that's a political decision. The Iranians made the right choice. They wouldn't have liked anything they started. Um, I forgot the second question because I got annoyed with that one. So go ahead. <laughs> I, I agree. It's a political decision. It's the reason we have to have these discussions. I think nation state to nation state, we have to define what the norms are. And there has to be clear lines drawn about what's acceptable and what's not. And I see this issue similar to weapons of mass destruction and the nuclear issue and it, that, at that level because the cascading impact of, of these types of attacks is going to impact the globe. Critical infrastructure, it's going to have a global impact on human life. Uh, I believe that. So I, I think that we've got to have those discussions at that level. Another question? Right over here. Okay. You, the guy who's looking around, that, he's... Oh. Okay. Here's one. Hi, uh, Jason Tom from Brookings. Just pull on the thread on the uh, deterrence theory piece and the Cold War analogy. So we don't want to propagate our capabilities seemingly because we have uh, superior offensive capabilities, or at least we think we do. But at some point, deterrence theory, doesn't there have to be uh, a credible threat of response? You know, for, for example, in the Cold War, it was the nuclear testing regime. What, what's, is, is there an analogy for that in the cyber realm? And, and will there be a day where we have to propagate our capabilities? Thank you. David, do you want to talk about that? Well, sure. You know, there are a lot of analogies between cyber and nuclear, and we do them because nuclear is familiar to us during the Cold War. You know, we went through a period of time where we were ahead with the weapon, and then the Soviets got it, the Chinese got it, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Israelis, and others. And so all the questions about deterrence that came up in the nuclear era are the same questions in some form or another that you would ask in the cyber era. The problem is all the answers are different. And they're different because in the nuclear era, states were completely in control of the weapons by and large, except in the past couple of years after AQ Khan began to, to start peddling weapons around. So in the cyber arena, states can have cyber weapons. Um, patriotic hackers, think about those who attacked other states on behalf of the Russians. Criminal groups, think of the Target case or the um, Home Depot case. Um, teenagers. And teenagers and criminal groups, they don't tend to sign treaties much. So, uh, so that's why this is so much more complicated in many ways than nuclear is. Now, on the other hand, it may not be as devastating, uh, which is, you know, truly good news. I mean, we used to talk in the nuclear age about how you could get bombed back to, you know, the Stone Age. In, in a big cyber attack, we could get knocked back to like the 1970s or something like that, and we'd all be dressed really badly. Um, but uh, so there's a little bit though. of a there's a little bit of a difference. <laughs> uh, let me add it if I can, David, because I, I I agree, but there's one disagreement, and that is with those that asymmetrical threat. So if it's not specifically in the nation state, and you can't have a treaty with a teenager or organized crime group, what you can do though is hold nations accountable for its citizens in terms of cooperating. I've personally worked and I've traveled internationally quite a bit talking to senior level officials in law enforcement and intelligence agencies about this, uh, about them helping, because it is a collaborative effort between the FBI and other agencies with our foreign counterparts. Um, and they've got to hold their citizens accountable. If those agencies came to, to the US, because there was an organized crime group targeting their financial services sector. I know what the response would be here, but I've not seen reciprocity, sometimes, not all the time. I should point out quickly that the CSIS and the Nuclear Threat Initiative have a big project on trying to figure out how deterrence works in cyberspace. And one of the issues is credible threat to whom? In the Cold War, we had one opponent. Now we have multiple opponents, and different threats may be what works with one may not work with the other. One more question right here. Yes, um, Captain, 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 Capt
in the Pentagon, you know, we have a lot of stove, stove pipes in the Pentagon and in, through our government. So maybe for Sean and the panel, how would you assess, you know, the United States government, all kind of uh, corporations, as far as like pulling the information together so we have a unified front? I think that there's been a lot of progress in that area. Um, in, in the U.S., uh, domestically here, the, the Bureau started the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force, which was a collaborative effort with the entire USIC, uh, NSA, CIA, DHS, all flavors of DOD, to look at um, uh, all the intelligence that each of those agencies bring against common adversaries, China, Russia, nation states, as well as some of these organized crime groups, et cetera. Um, each agency has different authorities, different capabilities, different capacity, and for each of them to be able to reach in and utilize their specific skill set and bring that to the table makes the nation much, much stronger in intelligence collection and then also in what the response is, providing senior policy leaders or, or officials uh, with key information so that they can make policy decisions. So that has happened here. Um, I think that that can always be better, um, but I think it's on the right track. Yeah, do you want to add anything? It, no, I think Sean nailed it. I mean, the uh, cyber coordinator's office, the, the, the response to Sony is a good example. Look how quickly they did it. So, and some of this comes from, what was the name of that guy they caught in Bangkok, you remember? The experience of terrorism has helped shape cybersecurity because it's the ability to combine intelligence disciplines, get law enforcement, FBI, NSA, DOD working together that gives us an edge. And in that, We've learned the hard way why it's good to cooperate. Well, on behalf of TCU and CSIS, thank you all for coming. Great to see you. Thank you, guys.